Welcome. Welcome. I think the wind blew all of us in here today because it is wicked cold out there. What'd you say back there? Oh, amen. Okay. Let us start this joyous, crisp morning by singing, Come, Thou Almighty King. What is our church's mission? To embody God's powerful love, welcoming all people with a vision and a message of hope, weaving deep relationships with Jesus and each other, working, praising, and playing in our towns and world. From Luke chapter 23, 33 through 43. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also uh, an inscription over him, the king, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged uh, there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And he indeed, um, and we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, led by you, God, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. I know that 
some of you, probably many of you, were raised Catholic. So you would call this Sunday Christ the King Sunday. Sound familiar? Yeah. And as Protestants, we renamed it the Reign of Christ Sunday or Majesty of Christ Sunday. God forbid we sound too Catholic. I don't know. Makes no sense to me, but anyway. Or we just had to change it to make ourselves different. No offense, Joby. <laughs> In this liturgical year, this is the first sun last Sunday of our Christian year. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the Christian year, and it also starts Advent. So in Advent's a season of preparation and waiting for the birth of Jesus. So we kind of flip forward in Luke's passage today to the end of Jesus' life, which the scene is pretty grim. It takes place at Golgotha, or the place of the skull. Stark crack contrast to next Sunday, when we're waiting for something really good to happen, expect it, full of hope and joy. And the contrast is no mistake here. And the passage in Luke takes place just before Jesus' last breath and his last words. And in Lent last year, we did a Lenten study, and it was all about the seven last words of Jesus. And the dialogue is between the three criminals, I purposely say three, um, rightly or wrongly accused, each on their own cross. Now, all their clothes are down on the ground. The Roman soldiers are casting lots for them. And to the authorities, Jesus was nothing more than a common criminal. That's all they saw him as. A non-Roman, for Romans were never crucified, man who was only worth the most awful type of death. Because when you're crucified, you die of asphyxiation. So why place this passage just before we start with the birth narrative? It is a reminder of how Jesus died, this young baby on the cross. It's which is the opposite of the expectations that next Sunday we talk about as we start to remember his birth. And around the birth narrative, I think of the, the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Because Jesus was, had his lineage all the way back to Abraham. So how did Jesus end up on a cross if he truly was the king of the Jews or the Messiah, what did he really do that was so wrong in the eyes of the authorities? What was so threatening to the people in charge of the religious system, the Pharisees, and the political system, the Romans, that they wanted him killed? What were they afraid of? For fear is what fueled their anger, and fear fuels their desire to have him killed. Fear to the extent that Herod asked or said that he washed his hands of it. He didn't want to have any association with it. He didn't want to be tied to Jesus' death. And Herod's statement is part of what has fueled over the years the hate of the Jews for, quote, murdering Jesus, killing Jesus which is not true. Now let's take a closer look at the scene of the three criminals on their crosses to help us understand why they feared Jesus, who is now very, very close to death. And there really weren't many outward differences between the three criminals. Luke relays that one of the things that Jesus says on the cross at the end is, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus is dying in excruciating pain, hungry, thirsty, mentally and spiritually exhausted, 
and yet he's able to sum up the energy to speak and to ask God the Father to forgive them. Jesus isn't just forgiving those that acted purposely just to demonstrate their power and control, which we know is always out of fear, so that the people in power and control could feel bigger and more powerful and put down Jesus, but also those who innocently went along with it, including one of the criminals. It was a dynamic when one is guilty that happens, easy to point the finger elsewhere and thus state, I'm innocent, I'm righteous, not me, not me. It's a way of shielding ourselves from any sense of wrong or blame and thus having to avoid those feelings that we don't like of guilt and shame. And this whole passage is about the juxtaposition between the worldly way of power and of seeing and the power and the control and the fear and the spiritual way of love and forgiveness. My question is, what did Jesus see in his persecutors that led him to forgive them for killing him, whether they were complicit in the crime or not? We know it's very hard for people to do so today, and yet you hear of that person that forgives the person that killed their son, killed their daughter. The naturally culturally learned response to that type of injury is to seek revenge, to want to have that killer or family member be given the death penalty that they can't even live. Never mind that won't bring the person back to life or take the pain of the grief away. It doesn't. People talk about it lessening it, that they feel righteous, that they've been revenged. and It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I propose that out of Jesus' love for each of us as the children of God, that Jesus' only choice was to love them, show them mercy, and thus to forgive them. I'm going to say that again. I propose that out of Jesus' love, pure, unconditional love for each and every one of us, that his only choice and our only choice should be to love them, show them mercy, and thus to forgive them. It's our goal, too. That is living a Christ-filled life. That is radical love and radical forgiveness that brings great blessings, love, and connection for all. We can only do this by humbly acknowledging that God is our Savior and comes first in our lives, above everything else, everybody else. God has to come first. Faith that God will lead and guide. Faith that God will show us the way. Faith that God will be our light and show us the path, the way, and that Jesus' kingdom will come to earth today. Jesus is being like the good shepherd, unlike the shepherd leaders that Jeremiah was railing about, as Lynn read. Jesus shows us the loving way to shepherd, to lead, to care for all, because all of us, at one time, are lost. God cares, God loves us, and therefore shepherds us. We've strayed at some point in our life, or many times, from our faith. We've turned inward and not connected to others, for example. We've turned the other cheek, or lost, or looked away, chosen not to help when presented with a glaring need in our community. I want to move now to the two criminals and what they saw in Jesus. 
All three of them were in the same boat, all on their last breath. All three had been convicted. All three were on their way to death. There was no saving them at the last minute. Or was there? To listen to criminal one, I'll call him, he taunted Jesus as he had seen and heard the Romans and others do. He said, save yourself. If you're the Messiah, save yourself. Oh, and by the way, me too. You know, we don't want Jesus just to save himself and not bring us along. He saw Jesus as a joke. And the inscription on his cross also was a taunting of Jesus. He saw Jesus as a person, as a criminal, weaker than he was, even with both of them dying on the cross. Because the criminal's fear led to his own attempt to have some dignity and some self-righteousness at the cost of Jesus. Very easy to blame Jesus and to throw him under the bus and feel exalted in his last breath. When might we have put down another to keep our fragile sense of ego alive? This too comes from fear of not being worthy. This criminal comes up lacking, and I would submit that he died very spiritually impoverished. That is not what God wants for us. God wants all, everybody. So what did the second criminal do and see in Jesus? He sees Jesus as Christ, as the Messiah, the Son of God, the opposite of who the other criminal, what the other criminal saw. The criminal, too, sees Jesus as love, the opposite of fear. And then this criminal sees and feels Jesus' love, and what's he do? He didn't say, save me. He admits his sin, his guilt. He doesn't have a need to falsely elevate himself. He's humble with that big H before God, before Christ. He then sees and states that Jesus is an innocent man. He sees who Jesus really is, not the Jesus that the Pharisees and the Romans portray him as, who his inner self is an innocent man that just loves everyone and wants that for everyone, who doesn't see the outwardly world that any of us show to each other. And this criminal then doesn't go and ask for his life back, nor does he want Jesus to perform any miracle to prove a point, which is reminiscent of Satan in the desert before Satan in the desert. Jesus in the desert and Satan tempting him before he goes into his ministry. And Jesus saying, no, not going to take it. Four times Jesus keeps his love of God and his hope and promise and denies Satan. Jesus could have gotten himself off of that cross. But that was not. That's the worldly message he would have given. And we wouldn't be here today. Jesus gave a message of love. He was humble. And that's the key to us, for us too. And following Christ's humility, an example of that, criminal too humbled himself. He took that love and turned it into action. He knows that he needs Jesus as God to help him do what he can't do by himself. He needs God's grace. He asks Jesus to remember him, not to save him. He's in essence asking for mercy and forgiveness, not to take him off the cross, 
not to keep him alive, but have mercy on me. It's a really good prayer to repeat over and over. Have mercy on me. Then Jesus tells this man that he will be with him that very day, immediately after he dies. They will be in paradise, a place of perfect rest and peace, very akin to the Garden of Eden. It takes us full circle back to where God started with us. And that's where we will end. By Jesus' death, he shows us a way to return to God's love and blessings, to admit our powerlessness, our humility before God, and our willingness to give ourselves up to God's will and desire for us, to God's mercy and righteous judgment. So there are very, two very different ways of looking at the world, at others. We're challenged daily to live in a spiritual world in a, in a spiritual way in a world that doesn't give any credence to doing so and puts tons of temptations before us to join the powerful who only think of themselves with no regard for the rest. Jesus is showing us to act on our faith. And I'm going to go off script here and fast forward two and a half pages, which I'm just going to throw out. Amen. And <laughs> God has called me to do this. And something happened yesterday that really moved me and struck me. And I think this is what we really need, me included, need to hear this morning. And I've been debating about it back and forth in my head. Should I, should I not? So I got a really clear message this morning from God when I'm printing my sermon. It stopped at this very spot. This stubborn German sometimes to be knocked over the head before I hear the Holy Spirit calling me. So he did. So I'm going to say it. And I, I, I hope to tell this story, because I had another story to tell, which I thought was OK. It was good. But this came along ago. Oh, God. OK. Got to, got, I'm, I'm called up here to preach, and here I go. So and I hope I don't offend anybody, because this is a lesson for me and hopefully a lesson for all of us. So um, we had a celebration of life here for Barb Trudy. And at the end, there were a bunch of us that were cleaning up um, and putting things away and asking people what they wanted, et cetera. And then a man came up to me from the, one of the people cleaning up and s said to me, there's somebody beside, behind us that, I'm not saying the words correctly, but basically, I think he needs our attention. So I turned around and there was a homeless man that had come in the front door down the hall in here and was just standing there. And he looked like he'd had a really tough time. Um, banged up. So I went over to him and I said, sir, how can we help you? And I could hear, I could smell clearly the alcohol on his breath. But who am I to judge? I'm an alcoholic. And so he said, I need a room. And he referenced a little motel just over the border into New York. So I talked a little bit. And then I pulled one of the deacons aside and said, you know, help me here in terms of, you know, we, I want to make this not just my decision, but this is a situation, can we get this man a room? And I started talking and she said, yeah. I said, well, he's talking of something just like really close by and I said, I can give him a ride there. Because he had his 
was only walking in clearly, clearly. Um, I mean, he had his beard trim, but that was about it. Yet, and so she, this person said to me, you can't drive him. And part of me was like, well, why not? But then it's like, I might be in danger and jeopardy. And I'm not saying this to put me up at all. I am the most innocent person. I'm going to die innocent. Amen. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been scammed. You know, like, I, I, and it's like, I know that about myself. So my first reaction is just compassion. And then, so that's the, the love part of me. And then I'm also thinking, oh, the worldly part of me is, you know, should I ask him if he has a knife or, you know, yeah. And it's like, but that's not my where I go to first. And part of me is, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this and it's like, should I have even had that thought? Um, but what's wrong with that thought? You know, this person was just another child of God who had the guts to come into a church to ask for help. And so I'm starting to think like, oh, we need to do some thinking here, you know, about how do we truly be welcoming and what's our response for it needs to be out of love yeah. so one of the first things I said to him is we got food yeah. you know like we're good church people we feed we eat well we know how to do that so he said he'd had a decent breakfast, but he, you know, he, he took some food. And then somebody said to me, well, he's kind of hanging around the table. It's like, yeah, it's okay. He's looking at what's there. You know, if I was in his footsteps, I'd want to look too and see what my choices were. You know, it's like a buffet. Oh, oh, I hate the, you know, the mushy green beans. Oh, stop, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That was a rabbit hole. I did not need to go on. Thank you very much, dear. So it's just like, and then people are like, we're on our cell phones, you know, where's a, and so we said, yeah, we can, we can pay a night, you know, for him someplace. Um, we know we're not solving the problem, but we can walk that next step with him. Amen. And at times that's all we're called to do is walk that next step. So he's not alone. <laughs> So he's taken care of, so he's loved. I don't give a hoot what he looks like. All it says to me is he needs taken care of. He needs love. Yeah. So people on their cell phones, and I'm calling. Do you have a room? No. Room? No. Oh. And then somebody says, well, Bar what about around the corner, the Marble Inn? And this is the truth. Part of me was like, oh, God, that's a really, really ritzy place. Will they even take him? And I'm thinking, oh, that's a, that's a horrible worldly thought, Karen. That's a horrible worldly thought. But it went through my brain. And then it's like, well, I'll call. I happen to know the woman that runs it because I am in the community and I attend, like six, seven of us, a little Bible study group at the Methodist Church. And again, it's those connections you never know. And we ended up with no place for him. And he chose not to go back to Rutland. And I think there's some stuff he's trying, clearly trying to avoid there, but okay. I don't need to know all the details. I get it. We'd have a bigger problem of how do we get him there. And if he's running from something, the police, whatever, okay. I'm not here to judge that. We're not here to judge that. We're here to help and love him. And so he had to go on his way. And that felt really horrible really horrible. 
And I heard somebody say, geez, we didn't even pray for him. And I thought, well, yeah. And he was at the front door, so I went out. I just went like this to him, put my arms around him and prayed and told him God loved him and he was loved. And I just ask that all of us say a prayer for this man who at this point in his life, which is all we know of the little slice, he's lost and he's seeking and he's hurting. And I'm sure he is feeling shame and not good. And he's probably feeling hopeless and helpless, which is just a recipe for suicide. And I can't tell you how many times I have heard the word suicide mentioned in the rooms of AA. So God and the Holy Spirit was speaking to the whole group that was here yesterday. When Jesus walked in through the door. So I know I'm going on a little bit, but I think this is important because it leads into what is God calling us to see as the need in our church and our church community? What do we see now as the vision of our church? We're at a transition point. Where do we want to grow? Where do we need to grow, but maybe afraid to do so? Where do we want to improve? Who's out there that needs us? Because they're not all going to come in our door. That's the unusual. We need to remember to look in the most unlikely places to find the answers. There's lots of hope and tons of opportunities out there. We need to talk with each other as we discern our way forward, as we live in faith in this experiment called life. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful servant that you have given us. And I ask, Lord, that you keep your hand upon her and that you give her the words that she needs when she needs them to help us, Lord, to be able to teach us and to move forward. And, Lord, I just ask that you give her peace and give her rest when she needs it. And I, I just ask, Lord, that you continue to just love on her as she loves on us. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for Karen and the servant that she is. Lord, we know that uh, where two or more are together, you are there. And so we can feel your presence here among us today. And we thank you for the blessings that you bring to us every day. And we thank you for Karen. And uh, we just ask you to continue to bless and anoint her in, in this position. You are making new fires. I have to take it now, don't I? You don't have to, but you can. <laughs> in this <laughs> Lord, I thank you. We all thank you for her presence, and we ask that you would just give us all the support that we need to support her. Always know that we are watching over her with you as our guider. Amen. Gracious Lord, we have felt you here today. We have also heard your voices in the singing, in the welcoming of people, in the words that have been spoken. Be with us as we go out and welcome others. Bless us as we move forward in life, taking a step at a time, bringing you with us, because we really never know 
where that next step will lead us. We give you thanks and blessings. And we know you have heard all the prayers that we have raised up to you. And will not only listen to them, but take care of them. We give them over to you, knowing that you will be with each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine. Bring new